Hi, welcome to this week's sermon audio from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today's message is entitled, Love Is, and it's based on 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 7. To follow along with the life notes, you can download them from our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. For by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father, which is in heaven. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And God demonstrates his own love towards us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am as a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge and even have a faith that can move mountains yet have not love, I'm nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and even deliver my own body to the flames and yet have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always believes, always hopes, always endures. Love never fails. Now remain these three faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So guess what we're talking about today? Yeah, (laughs) some of you are like, I don't know. (laughs) Hey, I'm going to invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 in your Bibles or your Bible apps. If uh, If you don't have a Bible with you and you are at one of our campuses, uh, we have Bibles that you can use. If you're here at our Sweetwater campus, just grab one of the Bibles and the seats around you. Turn to page 1,140. If you're at our Parker campus, there's a table right at the back of the room. Just get up right now and go grab one of the Bibles, turn to page 1,140, and you'll be able to follow along with us in Scripture. If you're joining us, uh, uh, and by the way, if you're any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just ask for one. The service, ho- uh, the, yeah, the service host, or you can email us at Cal calvaryaz.com and we will get you a Bible because we want you to read God's word because we know if you read and apply God's word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, we are talking about love and I just want you to know that our culture massively misrepresents what love is. I mean, they abuse the concept of love. They cheapen it. They ignore God's teaching and God's example. So what I want us to do today is look at the biblical definition of love. Now, uh, again, as we've said many times uh, as we walk through 1 Corinthians, this is for people who are following Jesus. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and that he was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then uh, God expects you to do all those verses that I just quoted. I mean, this is, we're going to talk about his standard, his expectation for his people. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, uh, we want you to hear what God expects of his people. 
because we want you to choose to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ, to commit to following Jesus so that he can change your life and fill your life with love. Okay, that's, that's what we want. So listen in, and, uh, and this is important because uh, if, if uh, this is the expectation for all Christian behavior, okay, for everyone who's a follower. And, and the first thing that we need to look at and see is that love is the priority. Love is the priority. Look at me again. By the way, I quoted uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I memorized it in the NIV. This is a little bit different. But uh, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, talking about being a, a human sacrifice, but have not love, I gain nothing. Paul is absolutely crystal clear at this point. He's saying, look, your giftedness, your talent, your abilities, all of those, your competencies, if you don't have love, it's unimportant. Because it just doesn't matter. If, you know, he said, look, I don't care how smart you are, how educated you are, how much knowledge you have, how much faith you have. I mean, think about the, what he's saying. You have a faith that can move mountains. He says, I don't care. If you don't love people, if you don't love God and love people, it doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing. He says, look, generosity is great, but without love, your generosity is insignificant. No matter how much you give, even if you give your own life for other people as an act of generosity, without love, it's insignificant. And Jesus clearly communicates this as well because he says, look, the first and great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your whole being is to love God. And by the way, the one that's next to it, the second one, is love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else depends on these two statements. Everything in the Old Testament, all the law and the prophets hang on these two words. So um, they're not, he, Jesus isn't being generic. He's not being like theoretical. He's actually talking about real love for people. So Paul is clear. Jesus is clear. So uh, let me just ask this. How do we miss this? How do churches miss this? I, I mean, look, every church I've ever been in talked about love. I mean, they, they, oh, we gotta love people. We all, we all know that we're supposed to do this, but how do we actually miss that nothing else matters uh, if, if we're not loving? Now, I grew up in church, so I know churches. Churches are easily impressed by degrees and titles and wealth and knowledge and outward piety. They look so good. But they often don't pay attention to how people treat people. I mean, I've been there. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been there when... You know, somebody in church, a leader in church, was just mean to other people. And leaders of the church, sometimes pastors, will make excuses for that person acting in a non-Christ-like manner. I mean, basically anti-Christ. Let's just call it what it is. And they make excuses. Well, you know, they meant well. Really, because it looked like they meant evil. <laughs> well, you know, they're good people. They have a good heart. No, their heart's wicked, just like everybody else's, okay? Uh, but we do that based on all these other things, but we don't pay attention to how they treat people. Now, as individuals, you have to look at your own life and go, why do I do that? But a lot of times we're influenced by people who are rich, who are smart, who are educated, talented, or maybe they're just an influencer. And we easily can ignore how they treat other people as well. But God's not making any exceptions. He says the priority is love. The priority is love. We have to love God. We, we, we must love the people around us. Nothing else matters if we don't love. That's what Paul so eloquently said. Nothing else matters if we don't love. Now, Paul said it very poetically. I, I'm not nearly that poetic. I'll just do it blunt. The word of God says nothing else matters if we don't love. Think about that. Think about all the religiosity that you've experienced, all the, the, our own thoughts of like, oh, if I can do this for God, if I can do that for God, if I can, and God's like, hey, you're, you're operating on the wrong grading system. I want you to love better because nothing else matters if you're not loving. I want you to do that other stuff, but, but I want you to love. 
That's what Paul says. That's what Jesus said, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must also love one another, because by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. By this one thing, they're gonna know that you're following Jesus if you love one another. <laughs> so it's really easy to understand why the world is confused about Christianity, isn't it? Because they see power lived out and they see, you know, wealth flaunted and they see all kinds of, you know, people who are judging people. They don't see the love. And, and here's the truth. We can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. We can't do it. Problem is we try to do it. We try to represent Jesus all different kinds of ways and, and it fails because we're not reflecting his character embodied by love. I mean, as followers of Jesus, we wanna represent God's holiness. We wanna represent God's truth. We wanna represent God's justice. But yeah, we're too busy to represent his love. And by the way, that's why so many unchurched people don't listen to us. Because Jesus said they'll know you by the way you love each other and they don't know you. You know what that means? That means that we have to lead with love. As individuals and as as a church, we have to lead with love. That needs to be the, the, the leading edge of who we are. Now, understand, truth has to be included. Because if you have love without truth, then uh, you're just gonna make people feel good on their way to hell. Okay? If you have truth without love, nobody's listening. So we need to lead with love, but we also need to incorporate truth and justice and holiness because those are all mandates as well. But the people of God who are committed to representing Jesus have to lead with love. And for the record, love is a choice. Love is a choice. Now, one of the most damaging corruptions of love is the you know, teaching from Hollywood and the world that love is a feeling that happens to us instead of a decision that we make. I can't help it, we just fell in love, but you're already married. Oh, I know, but I just fell out of love with this person and fell into love with that person. And, and if somebody actually says that out loud in my presence, I have to call them a liar, I'm sorry. You chose to stop loving one, you chose to start loving another. And I know this, because of Matthew 5, I quoted a little bit earlier, Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your heavenly father. Okay, do you ever feel like loving your enemies? Some of you didn't answer. Like, oh, let me think about that. No, you don't ever feel like loving your enemies. What do you feel like doing to your enemies? Yeah, hurt them. Delight in their demise, you know. We have these evil thoughts about what we like to see happen. You know, some of you are like, I'll pray for my enemies, yeah. I'll, I'll pray that a meteor falls on their head. And I'll pray that a car breaks down, you know, in between Barstow and Needles. I'll pray that... <laughs> I'll pray that they get explosive diarrhea in a traffic jam. Uh, I'll... Look... When Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you, he's praying, he's saying, look, you gotta pray for their blessing. You've gotta actually choose to work for their benefit. That's what it means to love them. And he says, you can decide to do this because you're never gonna feel like doing this. And the truth is that your emotions will follow your decisions if you choose to love. Which is why you can stay committed to your marriage relationship because every day you don't feel like it but you can decide to do it because you made this commitment, you can live up to it. So we're called to love people, our friends, our loved ones, our coworkers, our neighbors, our enemies. Some of you are like, but what if I don't have any enemies? That's so nice to think about, isn't it? All right, let me ask you this. Will you love people who vote differently than you? Oh, now suddenly you're like, well, that's not what it says in scripture. Now, let's just go ahead and call it what it is. We love people who look differently than you, who live different values than you. See, love is a choice, and we decide to love or we decide not to love, but it's our decision. And the Apostle Paul defines what the decision to love looks like. Now, I'm just, I'm just gonna say this because I, I've been around churches my whole life, and I've watched people do this from the pulpit, 
we love everyone. Everybody goes, yes, we love everyone. And then they walk out the door and nobody knows that they're being loved by these people. I'm just telling you, that, you, know, you can say that you love people, but unless they actually see it happen in your life, it, it doesn't mean anything. So what I want to do is I want to look at uh, the, the reality that love is action. And I want us to, to walk through 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Here, I'm just going to read it for you, and then we're going to walk back through it. Paul says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. I was uh, sure that keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Okay, so that's the action that Paul is describing. So again, let me just say, Love isn't an emotion. doesn't matter what Hollywood tells you. Your emotions will follow the decision to love. Love is not a declaration. Churches have been declaring their love for the world and for lost people and for, you know, their neighbors. But, um, you know, 1 John 4, 20, the Apostle John says, anyone who says he loves God yet hates his brother is a liar. He says, you can't love God who you haven't seen if you don't love your brother who you can see. He just, but he, I mean, he just calls it out. He says, look, you can say what you want, but if you, if you say you love God and you hate your brother, you treat your brother with contempt, then you're a liar. Love is a decision to act in a manner consistent with the character of Jesus. And then Paul gets brutally direct. I mean, we love reading this at, at weddings, don't we? But we don't really like reading it for ourselves. So I'm, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna walk through the actions of love, and I just want you to grade you. I don't want you to look at the people around you and go, that's right, are you listening? <laughs> I don't want you to look at your husband or your wife and go, are you paying attention? What I want you to do is to look at yourself and ask yourself, hey, how am I doing with this? Give yourself a pass-fail grade, I don't care. Uh, you can talk about it in life group, you can talk about it with your friends later on. Th- this, is, this is about what, what we need to interact with Scripture. So, Paul says, love is patient. (laughs) Are you? See, patience, which is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, means that we are okay waiting for God to work and we're okay waiting for people to understand. See, patience means that we allow the Holy Spirit to change people and it means that we do not selfishly demand life to revolve around us and our agenda. Now, the first part of that statement, that we allow the Holy Spirit to work, churches are notoriously impatient with the transformation process that God's Spirit is working in people's lives. And so we try to shortcut that process and we like to hand people kind of a list of expectations about this is what it looks like if you're gonna follow Jesus. So why don't you conform now? And people conform externally, but the Spirit hasn't changed them internally and they practice hypocrisy. That's not love, that's not patience. See, we talk about uncomfortable grace here at Calvary because we're actually gonna be patient and we know your life is a mess and we know that if you've encountered Jesus, he's changing your life and we're gonna give you the time for the spirit to change you because when he changes you, it's for real and it's forever. And and that's what we want is real life transformation and we don't want you practicing hypocrisy. On the other side, it's, okay, I just want you to hear this. Impatience is selfishness. Because when we're impatient, what we're saying is, I want the world to operate around me. I want the world to revolve around me. And so I want stuff to happen on my time schedule in the way that I want it to be. That's basically what we're saying. So when you lose your patience, you're basically demonstrating your selfishness out loud. So wives, are you patient with your husbands? Husbands, are you patient with your wives? Parents, are you patient with your children? When you're at a restaurant, are you patient toward the waiter? When you're at a doctor's office, are you patient toward the medical office staff? When you're at the DMV, are you patient? (laughs) Oh yeah, see, I'll hit below the belt. I don't care. Are you patient towards other drivers, Chad? (laughs) Hey, look, God's been dealing with me on patience for a long time, and he usually does it in the car. So... uh, So love is patient and love is kind. 
Kindness is also a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And kindness recognizes, I always think about this. Kindness recognizes that every single person you encounter has their own struggles, their own hurts, their own you know, difficulties in life. And kindness gives them grace because they're struggling too. Again, it chooses not to think of yourself first, but it chooses to say, hey, they've got their issues, so I'm going to uh, treat people with gentleness and respect and kindness. So I would ask the question, are you kind? And all of us would go, yes, we're wonderful people. So here's the follow-up question. When are you unkind? When are you unkind? Because all of us can be unkind. And if you don't believe me, just ask the people who know you well. You know what my guess is? My guess is that you're the most unkind when you're impatient. Think about that. The two kind of go together. So love is patient. Love is kind. Love is also content and humble. Content and humble. Uh, Paul said love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. Think about those. Being content means we don't look around and want what other people possess. That's what envy is, right? Envy looks around and says, hey, I want your wealth. I want your toys. I want your talent. I want your relationships. But contentment means we're satisfied with God's blessings. And humble means that we're not gonna be boastful and arrogant and proud because when we live out, you know, being boastful, arrogant, and proud, you know what we are? We're rude. And if you're arrogant all the time, then you're a jerk. Let me just say that again. I don't, they, Paul didn't use the J word, but I will. You're a jerk when you believe that you're actually better than other people. That's what arrogance is. Arrogance says, well, I'm better than other people. I'm more important than other people. Therefore, I deserve better treatment than other people. I deserve to cut to the front of the line. I deserve to get waited on first. I, you know, whatever the, the thing is where you believe you deserve better treatment than others. By the way, Anytime we feel that way, we need to be reminded that's the opposite of Jesus. Jesus chose to be a servant when he was king of kings and lord of lords. We aspire to be king of kings when we're called to be servants. Love is content and humble. And love thinks of others first. I mean, Paul says, does not insist on its own way. Uh, does not demand its own way. The NIV says isn't self-seeking. It thinks of other people first. Look, it, we are taught by this world, this culture we live in, to put ourselves first, that it's all about me. I gotta take care of me. No one else is looking out for me. And that's the world's orientation. That's the, the you know, that's, the, that's Satan's orientation. Me first. But Jesus and the Apostle Paul Say, hey, look, put others first. Think of others first. I mean, the Apostle Paul actually says that in Philippians 2. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. He doesn't say they are more important. He just says, consider them more important. And, and not only look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. He says, that's what I want you to do. Um, if your orientation of life is me first, then that's being selfish and that's not love. So here's a test. When something happens in life, when something goes wrong in life, when your plans blow up, is your first thought about how it impacts your life or do you think about how it impacts other people's life? Are you upset because uh, your plans now have to change or are you upset because this is da damaging other people's lives? See, that, that's a question that kind of reveals where our heart is in this. And... Uh, and it will tell you, hey, am I thinking of others first or am I thinking of myself first? You see, our culture is self-centered. So it's easy for us to fall into being self-centered. Uh, love challenges this orientation of me first, of being self-absorbed. And, and it challenges us to choose to think of others first. So love thinks of others first and love forgives. Love forgives. Uh, in the ESV, it says, love is not irritable or resentful. In the NIV, it says, keeps no record of wrongs. I like that. Love forgives. 
We all know the character of Jesus is grace and mercy. Because without Jesus being the sacrifice for our sins, we're all destined for hell. But because Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins, then everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be forgiven and will receive eternal life. That's grace, that's mercy. So when you receive that from God and you know that God loves you and you love God, then guess what we do? We forgive other people. That's what love does, love forgives. That's why it's so important. You know, Jesus is the ultimate example of love. He modeled forgiveness. And by the way, the, the harshest teachings of Jesus outside of his comments toward the Pharisees, his, his harshest teaching to the common people, that's us, was about unforgiveness. It was about unforgiveness. Dangerous things were said about unforgiveness. So whomever you need to forgive is the person you need to love. And the way you love them is by forgiving them. See, when I said whomever you need to forgive, probably somebody or somebody's popped into your brain right now. Especially if you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit went, boom. You know who. You know who. You know who we're talking about right now. It's not about what I'm talking about. It's about you and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's like, you need to forgive them. By the way, the direction or the command to forgive is given to bless us. See, God wants you to forgive them because forgiving them will bless you. See, a lot of times we think, well, if I'm gonna forgive them, I'm gonna bless them and I don't feel like blessing them because, you know, I'm forgiving them. No, if you forgive them, it blesses you because God's gonna clean all that garbage out of your soul and you're gonna be free to live for Jesus. You're gonna be free to enjoy life. So what it boils down to is this. Do you want your life filled with God's love? Okay, I'm gonna ask again, because some of you are asleep. Do you want your life to be filled with God's love? Yes. Then forgive. Do you want your life filled with the joy of Jesus? Yes. Then forgive. Do you want freedom from guilt and shame? Yes. Then forgive. I mean, it, it, it really works that way. And when we love God, we forgive. We forgive others. We forgive the people who have hurt us. Everybody in this room has been hurt by somebody, probably multiple somebodies. And love means you choose to forgive them. Why? Because Jesus loves you and he forgives you. So you love them and you forgive them. Um, so you forgive others. But it also means that um, you forgive God. Now, God didn't do anything wrong to you. God didn't offend you. I'm just saying this. But some of you are blaming God for what happened because he didn't stop it from happening because we live in this broken, sinful world and destruction is happening because of sin and all of us are sinners, so all of us are touched by destruction and death and it's not fair because grace and heaven means that that's what we get and that's not fair, that's grace. Fair is we all go to hell. So, um, so but some of you are still angry at God. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're joining us online. But some of you are still angry at God. Why did God let that happen? You need to go ahead and say, God, I, I'm angry at you and I'm, I don't want to be angry at you anymore. And you let that go. Some of you need to forgive yourself. You, you know who you are. You hold yourself to a higher standard than God holds you. Because the blood of Jesus cleansed you from all sin and yet you're still saying, not that one. No, nope, I was too bad, I was too... And, and you just need to forgive yourself for being human. And I, I think human must be some, you know, extraterrestrial word that really just means stupid and rebellious. Because that's what all of us have been, right? Am I the only one who's been stupid and rebellious? Anybody else? Okay, some of you are like, well, I, I've been rebellious. Can I just tell you, you've defied God, the, the one who is wisdom incarnate, so you've been stupid, okay? If that offends you, read the Bible. Hey, if you really want to be offended, read Proverbs, okay? Because they will smack you upside the head with a two by four. So uh, I'm just saying, forgive yourself because you're, you're a person like all the rest of us and we've all, you know, we've all biffed it in major ways. And yet God looks at us and goes, I still love you and I still forgive you. So receive that forgiveness and, and that's part of love. God's love for us and your love for other people. So love forgives and love celebrates truth does not delight or rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. 
See, love celebrates. But you know, when I say love celebrates, it celebrates life change. Like our, our couple that got baptized tonight, declaring their faith in Jesus publicly to the whole world. Love celebrates that. I love listening to this church celebrate baptism. It is such a joy. Love celebrates victory over self-destruction. Love celebrates reconciliation. The stories of, we haven't talked in years. Love celebrates people seeking and serving Jesus. So here's, a, here's again, here's a question. What are you celebrating? Because whatever you're celebrating reveals your heart. So love celebrates the truth, and love is faithful. Love is faithful. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love doesn't fail. See, that, what that means is love doesn't doubt, doesn't despair, and it doesn't give up. Love doesn't doubt, despair, or give up. I, I know that's hard to hear for the depressed skeptics ready to throw in the towel. But choosing love means that we choose to believe in God and in people. And yes, people will let you down. I, I get that. But if you look at everybody waiting for them to fail you, you're going to be miserable and alone. Love chooses to say, hey, God still believes in me. I'm going to believe in them. And I'm going to give them grace when they fail. Choosing love means that we choose to hope no matter the circumstances. No matter what the circumstances are, you may be sitting here thinking, I've got no chance. These circumstances are so bad. But can I just remind you, we serve a God who is not daunted by any circumstances. He can redeem. See, choosing love means we choose to endure even when it looks hopeless. Because God is a God of hope. See, we do that. We choose to love. We choose faithfulness because Jesus never gives up on us. I want you to hear that really personal. Jesus never gives up on you. Some of you need to hear that tonight. Jesus hasn't given up on you. You see, because of the love of God, we win. Because of the love of God, we are victors. So why not choose to love? Because after all, we get heaven and we don't deserve it. So I wanna challenge you to choose to love. Choose to love your spouse, choose to love your children and your grandchildren, that's easy. Choose to love your siblings, choose to love your political adversaries, choose to love the people who disagree with you, choose to love the people who annoy you. Choose to love because we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character and people are watching. By the way, before we pray, there are some who have not yet experienced the love of God through Jesus Christ. And you've been listening to us talk about love and you've been thinking, yeah, but does it apply to me? And I'm just telling you right now, it applies to you. And if you have never surrendered to Jesus, you've never felt his love in your life, then we wanna invite you today to do that right where you sit. Just simply say, Jesus, I need you to forgive me. I need you to save me. I surrender my life to you. You're my Lord and he will enter your life. You're gonna feel his love like never before and he's gonna change who you are. And if you do that, if you make that decision, let us know fill out a connect card, find a pastor, come pray with the prayer team, tell them, because we wanna cheer you on in this life of love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. We know we don't deserve it, but we thank you for it. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Thank you for claiming us as your own when we were lost and, and just, we didn't care. But God, help us to not only encounter your love, but help us to love like Jesus so that our friends, our family, our neighbors can see the difference and can be drawn to the reality that Jesus is the only one who can change their life. He's the only one worth building their life on. So Jesus, we surrender again to you and we ask that you would teach us how to love. It's in your name we pray, amen. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. 
and the greatest of these is love. That's from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and you can subscribe to receive our Word for the Day daily devotionals. Well, that's it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.